Hi, this is Marcia. And this is Kelly. We are the two U's of Two U's Fiber Adventures. Thanks for stopping by. You'll hear about knitting, spinning, dyeing, crocheting, and just about anything else we can think of as a way to play with string. We blog and post show notes at Two U's fiberadventures.com and we invite you to join our two use fiber adventures group on Ravelry. I'm 100 projects and I am better in motion. We're both on Instagram and Ravelry and we look forward to meeting you there. Enjoy, Enjoy the, the episode. episode. Hi Marsha. Hi Kelly. Is it still cold in Seattle? Yeah, it's cold. It's like in the, it's in the twenties. Oh my gosh. Well, I actually, let me take it back. It's in the twenties at night and then it's in like the low thirties during the day. Okay. So about the same as when but, I was Yeah, but we're, we're having, it's, it's like when you were here, we're having mm-hmm. sun, beautiful sun today where a couple of days ago it was very, um, cold, but also really, uh, windy mm-hmm. and cloudy, dark skies. And so it was so cold. The, I think it said it was 35 degrees, which doesn't, isn't that cold, but it, the wind was just terrible and freezing cold when you go out there, just that wind chill. Um, yeah. So today it's beautiful sun, just like when you were here, uh, days like that. So. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah we have sun. Yeah. We have mostly sun today and it's supposed to be sunny over the weekend, which will be nice. Mm-hmm. I'm glad about the rain. Um, I, I, I have a rant I could give about the people who have said to me, um, well, if I hear about the drought now after all this rain, <laughs> I don't want to hear anything more about drought. Anyway, I won't do that rant today. That will be a rant for another episode. <laughs> yeah. This is a, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's nice today. I have one more weekend before school starts. Mm-hmm. So, so I've been trying nice. to get a lot of knitting and spinning done. Yeah. Did you, uh, I know you had a lot of goals that you had set just for this break, right? That you wanted to finish. Did you do pretty well on those? I, or I know the... did okay. Well, let's just say I got about a C. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, we're grading ourselves, are we? <laughs> it was adequate. Actually, I, I, I did get a lot of house stuff done. Mm-hmm. So things, you know, just general things. I think I vacuumed more from Thanksgiving to now. Than I did the whole rest of the year. <laughs> so that's a little, that's, that's maybe something I shouldn't admit to the rest of the world, but yes, that. Okay. Well, if we're making confessions, <laughs> I, <laughs> I did more vacuuming the weekend before you arrived than I've done the entire year. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah. I did so much vacuuming. I called my brother to come out, come over and help me help vacuum. you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> that's funny. Well, knitting is way more fun than vacuuming, yeah. so that's yeah. what I'm doing while we while we talk today. Okay. Well, this is not true confessions. This is actually a knitting podcast. So, what are you knitting on? <laughs> I'm knitting. <laughs> I'm knitting on my poncho. The Om okay, shawl. I am too. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. By Andrea Mowry, and I'm using Neighborhood Fiber Company yarn, and it's three different, three different shades of gray. I don't remember the names of them. Druid Hill, I think, is one of the names. Federal Circle. They're all named after places in Maryland. Mm-hmm. In any case, three beautiful shades of gray, two of which are so close that it's hard to tell them apart when you're doing color work. <laughs> Which led to a mistake that I didn't see, again, because they are so much alike. A mistake that I didn't see until I was about four inches past it. And so I had to do some, quite a bit of ripping. And actually, I had ripped that one section of the color work out like three times before I thought it was right and kept going. Mm-hmm. So it was a little frustrating, but it's past me now, and I, I fixed it, and I'm happy. Well, I had, you posted pictures of it on Instagram and I had to look several times to figure out what the mistake was. Mm. Um, A lot of people mentioned that in the, in the post. Yeah. Which I think really, I mean, when say, then when I saw it, it's like, oh yes, I totally understand why you wanted to rip it out. Yeah. I I understand. Once you see it, it, you can't unsee it. Yes. Once, yeah, that's true. (laughs) (laughs) 
So, yeah. yeah. I decided yeah. to take it out. And it was the right decision. I There are so, some things where I don't. I'm like, ah, whatever. And I don't mm-hmm. bother to rip it back. But I was enjoying knitting with this yarn. And the color work is kind of the star of the show. So... I mm-hmm. wanted it to, I wanted it to be right. So yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't bad to undo it. it. I mean, it was a lot of knitting to undo. It was painful, but once mm-hmm. it's over, it's kind of like ripping off a band aid. Once it's over, mm-hmm. it's not so bad. Yeah. So, I know. It's the thought of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's worse than doing it. So. so that's been my main project recently. And then, um, I finished six pussy hats and mm. put them in the mail along with four that my aunt made and sent them to Washington, D.C. for that Pussy Hat project for the Women's March on Washington. Um, so that was really exciting. And I I did them as gifts, part of the Christmas gift for my nieces and my sister and my brother. And I was going to embroider their name on the inside, and mm-hmm. I just couldn't. I couldn't make it work. The mm-hmm. yarn was too chunky, and I, it just wasn't working. And I thought, oh, this is going to take me forever. So I just took a Sharpie. I thought, you know, mm-hmm. the people who get these hats are going to wear them for the march. Mm-hmm. And probably that's it. And so I just took a Sharpie and put, um, you know, their name, the name of the person is with you on the inside mm-hmm. and sent them off. So that was fun. That was a that was a fun project. Yeah. It's been fun looking um, on Instagram at the, at, if you go to, you know, hashtag pussy hat project, mm-hmm. all of the hats people are making. I and know. It's amazing how, how many people have made a lot of hats that they're sending to DC. Yeah. 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 So I'm sure yeah. we will see, we'll be able to see them. Um, at first I thought, oh, we're not going to be able to see, you know, there's not going to be like, they talked about a sea of pink hats mm-hmm. and I thought, oh, probably not. But I, I, now I'm not so sure there are an awful lot of hats. I think I talked about this in the last episode. I can't remember when I talked about it, but I'm making it. Well, mine's um, nearly done. I just have maybe about a quarter inch of the ribbing to do and then bind off and sew it up. Mm -hmm. Um, My friend Kim, I think she's making three. One's going to D.C., going with a friend that's going to D.C. She's making one for herself and one for a friend that's going to march in the march in Seattle. But we, we talked about how hard it was finding pink yarn. Um, yeah, right. Here. Mm-hmm, we uh, and, and so there was actually an article in the Seattle Times uh, a couple of days ago that um, there's been a run on pink yarn <laughs> in the city of Seattle that people can't find. They're having a hard time finding pink yarn. Wow. Yeah. That means there's a lot of hats being made that yeah. are going to be, be back there in D.C. or these marches that right. are happening all around the, uh, across the country. So yeah. it'll well, be I fun. Have... It's been a fun, fun. It's been fun to feel a part of something, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of a movement. So that has been good. And I have yeah. a, I have some yarn left. I think I have three hats to make because I'm going to the march in San Francisco. And then so is one of my nieces and her husband. And maybe Robert, if he gets the day off. Anything else you're working on? or? Well, I got inspired. One of our listeners, a uh, relatively new listener, or newly introduced to us in the group, uh, Stacy DSL, She actually Mm -hmm. started her own group in Ravelry called Spinning with Friends. I was reading through those posts and got kind of inspired to dig out some old, old stash of fiber. Mm -hmm. They were talking about using different fiber and that where do you get fiber? And I thought, okay, I don't need to get any fiber because I have enough, (laughs) but maybe Mm -hmm. I should go searching. So I went and looked in this box that I keep of some of the oldest fiber stash. And so I took out some, I had some bats of long wool. So Mm -hmm. one of them was a Lincoln Corydale cross. There was a shepherdess um, whose name was Sandy McCabe. And she used to have fleeces at the Monterey wool show a lot. And I loved her fleeces. She had Lincoln Corydale crosses and they had Mm -hmm. the most beautiful silky fleeces. And so one of the bags was that and then I had another little bag of probably a Lincoln fleece that I had over dyed with burgundy back when I was making the wall hanging that was inspired by all the lettuce fields. Anyway, so I took those out and I spun them and I applied them. I haven't washed them yet, but so I've got three skeins. Two of them are maybe an ounce or two. 
Mm-hmm. And then one, the burgundy one is really small. But that was fun. I had thought maybe it would be a little bit too old and sticky. If it doesn't get completely washed, sometimes they get sticky. I mean, these right. are, we're talking 2002, I mm-hmm. think. So over 10-year-old stash. Um, and so I thought maybe they might be a little sticky, but they weren't. They, I had carded them. Uh, they're long wools, so I carded them on my drum carter, kind of in line. I like tried to keep all the locks going the same direction, because mm-hmm. you know normally carding is to like mix them all up and make them fluffy. But right. I had tried to make them more in line, and then I pulled them apart, you know, lengthwise. So the the fibers were pretty much, I mean, not totally aligned. There were ta- some tangles, but the fibers were pretty much aligned and. And so I spun those up and that was kind of fun. And it was nice to know that I was getting rid of, you know, well, I was changing the form really, not getting rid of it, Mm -hmm. but I was taking something that had been sitting around for a long time and, and actually getting something done with it. So, yeah. So that was a good, a good feeling. Yeah. So I actually got some spinning done. And then I also, I also ended up plying another two skeins of that endless CVM fleece that I've been spinning on. So. Oh, right, right. So I have, I, I have about, yeah, I have are about. Getting near, are you getting near the end? I'm, the I'm not sure. I should weigh the, I should weigh the singles that I have, the bulky singles that I have, because I, mm-hmm. I weighed the three ply. When the fleece came back from processing, it was six pounds. And I weighed the skeins of three ply that I have, and it's not even a pound. And it feels like I've been spinning that forever. Mm-hmm. So I need to spin, I need to weigh the skeins of the bulky singles that I have because combined, I want to know what's the weight of the, what's the weight of that, that I've already spun. Mm-hmm. I know I've got a significant amount left because I can see it in the garage, these big giant <laughs> balls of wool. So, mm. but I'm, I'll make progress on that. I couldn't resist popping in here while I was editing to add what I've discovered after weighing the bulky singles. So I have a total of 775 grams of the bulky singles. That's 27.3 approximately ounces. And so that puts the total of what I've spun combining the two plot, the three ply and the bulky singles at approximately two and a half pounds of the CVM has been used out of six pounds. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that was Good. that was what I have been doing in the last week or so. What about you? The only thing I've been working on is my uh, poncho. Okay. My Rodeo, di- Rodeo Drive poncho. And I think I have, let me think here. I had six balls of yarn and I think I have one and a half left. Oh, so you're I'm getting close. close. I'm getting close. Yeah. All right. So, so ready to start a new project? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I should not start a new project, but I have, well, I need to work on, I need to go back and work on the uh, shawl with the Duran Dye Works yarn. I had right. started a shawl and I need to go back and work on that because I do, I want to get that done um, mm-hmm. for the knockers retreat. But I have been looking at patterns to use the cotton llama that we bought or I bought when we were together. This is the Queensland collection, Llama Soft Cotton, oh, that yeah. I bought over at Quint- Quintessential Knits. And so I've been sort of looking at patterns because it seems like it would be a good you know, spring, summer weight cardigan. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been kind of looking at patterns. Nothing to, I haven't made a decision. I've just been sort of, you know, how you... Yeah. Peruse Ravelry, just sort of thinking Browsing about something. and thinking. Yeah. And, yeah. So that's, I mean, honestly, really, I've not, I think it's been so kind of crazy around here that I haven't really done very much knitting or um, I've not been doing any spinning or anything like that. Well, but, um, it'll, I'll get back on track. Yeah. I, I, I really want to get this poncho done. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm anxious, like, kind of excited to get this done. Yeah. It's um, nice when you get close enough that you can see the end. And then mm-hmm. you just want to sit and work on that particular project. Right. That's, I like that feeling. And I, I have to get it done before Stitches West. Yes. That was the goal so I can wear it at Stitches West. I mean, that yeah. will be here before I know it. That I mean, is true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it well, will fly by. The, yeah, yeah. So um, just a little bit more than a month. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe about six weeks, something like that. Woohoo! Exciting. <laughs> 
Exciting. Well, I'm exci- I'm excited to go, but now I have this pressure <laughs> that I have to finish this poncho. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, you're further along than I am. I'm not even well, halfway that's true. done with this ohm shawl. I'm still on that's my, true. I took my yarns. It, I took my, yeah. because I was changing the color scheme and not doing the whole middle section all one color. I took my yarns and split them into, you know, used my scale and split them into half equal, you know, e- mm-hmm. into equal portions. So I'm still mm-hmm. working on the the first half. I'm still in the first set of of yarn balls. So, so yeah, I have more to do than you, but I'm, I'm at the point now where it, I think I can do it as meeting knitting. Mm -hmm. So I'll be able to bring it for our first, our, you know, our initial uh, days of school for meetings. It looks like the pictures of the pattern. It looks like it's a lot larger than what I'm making. I mean, it seems like you have a larger volume of knitting, but maybe it's just it's the perspective because well, it's a rectangle. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I have 1,200 yards mm-hmm. of this neighborhood fiber company, and it doesn't call for 1,200. I think it only calls for about 1,000 yards. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how that compares to yours. Well, it calls for 10 balls of Knit Picks Capra, which is not what I'm using, and each ball is 123 yards. So that's so 1,200. 1,200, yeah, a little over 1,200. So yours yards. is actually more yarn. Yeah. More yardage than mine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm hoping to use, I'm using a little bit smaller gauge needles than the pattern actually called for. So I'm actually hoping to use up my whole 1,200, but Mm -hmm. I don't think I will. This fiber company yarn is very nice, but also kind of pricey. I mean, it was a Mm -hmm. splurge, you know, so Mm -hmm. I'd like to, I'd like to actually have it end up in my in my poncho rather than in a ball of yarn that's leftover that's right know, yeah leftovers yeah. that gets used for just some odds and ends kind of thing mm-hmm. so but we'll see but i'm anxious to see i'm anxious to see yours done and i'm anxious to have mine done and wear it well i'm anxious to have mine done and wear it too mm-hmm. <laughs> i'm just <laughs> i yeah i really would like to i just i really like this yarn yeah i really like it and i love i still love the color you know how sometimes when you're knitting on something you're like oh, okay maybe i'm getting tired of that color mm-hmm. now you know but i still am not tired of it so i really like it anyway and i think our colors are kind of similar now that i'm thinking about it mm-hmm. i mean mine's not solid but it's but it's kind of a warm grays mm-hmm and mine is sort of, I don't know, you saw, but it was sort of mushroom colored, mm-hmm. sort of gray, gray, brown. Right. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, I think it's, it's more, the, I think it's the natural color, I think. Of yeah. The... Yours is more brown. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's a gray, it's a gray version of brown kind of, mm-hmm. whereas these grays of mine are sort of brown versions of gray. Instead of warm gray, so <laughs> you'll be easy to. We'll people, be color be coordinated. To, yes. Well, I say it'll be easy to spot us. We're in gray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unlike last year when I was in my purple vest, my purple striped vest, and those yeah. wild shoes. Well, Kelly, um, the one thing we d- we we're going to talk about. Do you remember what we did a year ago? Oh yeah. Well, not really, but <laughs> through the magic. Through the magic of podcasting and research, <laughs> we were able it's to a, look the, back, huh, Marsha? Well, there's a per, there's a permanent record of That's what we right. said. <laughs> That's the problem with the podcast. Yes. And anyway, we a year ago we set long term sort of our, our uh, goals for the year, mm-hmm. our long term goals. And Kelly, how did we do? Well, you did pretty well. I'm not sure I did as well as you did. <laughs> Well, should we be honest mm-hmm. with our listeners? Yes. We had to look back. We couldn't remember. <laughs> That's how, yeah. We, <laughs> we had to look back at our notes. What were our long-term goals? Yeah. And then we, the thing is we did remember most of them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the, my big long-term goal was to the Afghan. Yes. The, uh, and so I using up the yarn from my dad's sweater, and I was successful. I finished that. Um, so that was my big goal and I did meet that goal. Yeah. Others, not so much. Well, but but that um, was a, that was a, I mean, that was a huge epic project and a lot of yarn and a lot of stitches. It was a lot of garter stitch. A lot of, a lot of winding. (laughs) 
of yarn. A lot of well, and it was you a died, lot of and you dyed a lot of the yarn that went that went with yeah, it. Yeah, because I I had to unravel the sweater. Mm-hmm. I had to wind it into skeins, mm-hmm. wash it all, wind it into balls. I had to repair Fix the all moth the, damage. Right. Mm-hmm. I had to. I washed all the yarn from the Goodwill because you know I didn't know where mm-hmm. it had been. So I washed all of that and reskeined it, put it in balls. And then I had to dye some. I went down to um, Jorstad for the dye weekend and over dyed. And then I dyed some of my own. Yeah. A listener, con- a listener contributed yarn, but it was yeah. a lot of work putting all of that together. And then, of course, the mental gymnastics of always rearranging the colors, trying to decide <laughs> right. in what order I wanted the colors. So it was a lot of work. It, well, was, uh, it was fun for me to see it in person last week mm-hmm. because I think... I mean, I, I had seen pictures of it, but to see it in person and actually touch it is such a nice afghan. Well, and to lift it up, to heft it. <laughs> That's right. So <laughs> heavy. But all of those colors, I think you did a good job of putting them together. And I think the idea of the sort of bookending of similar mm-hmm. colors on each edge was was really good. But I honestly think that the colors that you had and the way that afghan is constructed with the two yarns, you know, the one mm-hmm. the one color that goes all the way through it, is mm-hmm. that you probably could have put them in any order mm-hmm. and gotten something that you looked at and went, wow, that's really pretty. Yeah. Because you know, it's true that the main color, it when you combine it with the other colors, it changes them in a way. And mm-hmm. so you have that consistent blue going all the way through. So somehow all the colors go together. Yeah. It makes everything, Uh, it makes everything work in a way that I think was probably would be surprising to people. I mean, you, you got quite a few opinions about, Oh no, you can't put that in there. That will be awful. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Or, or, Oh no, you should put it this way or that way. Or, and, and I know you had some misgivings about some of the colors. You know, yeah, you were like, I'm not sure I should use this. Yeah. So. And then I, uh, and I kept, and I rearranged them. I mean, I rearranged them a hundred times probably before I started knitting. Mm-hmm. And then I kept, and I, the only thing is I knew for sure that I wanted the, um, sort of that book end of the, the two colors yeah. at each end. But beyond that, within that, and I would be getting ready to start the next color and I would change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so well, and that was part of the fun of it probably, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it was, it was fun. And, uh, it's warm too, because, uh, when Robert spent a lot of time under that Afghan, when you guys were up here, in fact, the, the day that we were out doing something on our own Tuesday, mm-hmm. he napped under it. Mm-hmm. I think he just stayed home and napped. So yeah, he, anyway. he, he really liked it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but the other thing I said I was going to do, and I did not do so good on this, was to create a fiber arts space. Um, so, you know, I didn't need to have like a separate building for a studio, even though I would love to have something like that. But I just wanted to create a space in the basement. Um, and that was, I didn't really do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did organize all my yarn so it had been sort of fairly organized but not that well organized so I did go to the Goodwill and just got some extra bins and so Kelly you saw it I have Mm -hmm. you know um, all the cottons together all the leftovers you know sock yarn is all together your hand spun that you've made me that's all in its own bin my hand spun's all in its own bin uh, you know, all the lace weights together and finger yeah. weights together. and Yeah, Marcia, yeah. you've come a long way since the day that I visited you and you said, oh, my gosh, you have to come see my horribly large stash. <laughs> and was it, the, it was in the shoebox. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a shoebox full of sock yarn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I in, so in, all, in all fairness, you did have a box in the basement, much of which you ended up sending to me of left, right, leftovers true. from other projects and and right. um, a project that you had written. You got out. the, um, we may have talked about this, and we're getting off topic now about our goals, but the yarn I sent you, well, when I was going to make this sweater, I don't know what I was thinking about the colors. Cause there's it was not a 1980s a sw- Intarja sweater, right? 
Well, there was the the one that was all like the really the bright greens and yellows. Mm-hmm. I think you made like a baby blanket I or did, something yeah. like that one. And then there was the infamous intarsia sweater that was supposed <laughs> to look like a patchwork quilt. Yeah. And it was like maroon and blue, mm-hmm. maybe blue and like a marled thing. Anyway, I've used I love the, some of that, the yeah. I love the yarn. Mm-hmm. I think it was just Cascade 220, mm-hmm. I think, and I love the colors and everything, but that was the project that I've talked about, <laughs> you know, at that retreat that I want, I thought, I'm going to take it out to the parking lot and throw it in the garbage yes. can. <laughs> Marcia. And what I did, yeah, I sent you the yarn, because, and then Kim came over and I said, I just can't make this sweater anymore, but I've got all this yarn, so I'll just take it and I'll make another sweater. And so we were standing in the yarn shop trying to figure out how what to do with this. And finally she said, do you even like those colors anymore? Because it's now, how old? Let's see. Yeah. I bought that yarn when Ben was on maternity leave. Or not Ben was on maternity leave. I was on maternity <laughs> leave with Ben. And he's 19. Yeah. And so this, so at that point, the yarn was about 10 years old. Yeah. And she said, do you just want to get rid of it and start over? And I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe I should just do that. So you got all that yarn. Yeah, and I think and you, you sent you, it to me. You sent it to me like in 06 or 07. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've used, used most it, of right? it. I've used most yeah. of it. Yeah, there's not yeah. much left. Now, yeah. I must admit anyway. some of it, because it was all in little bitty teeny balls of yarn mm-hmm. that you had undone things, mm-hmm. um, that part of it, a lot of it went out to the well house, you know, the garden shed area, and it has been used to tie up plants. <laughs> That's fine. Well, because the thing is that intarsia... Um, you know, it's like you're supposed to put on little bobbins mm-hmm. where you can only get what two yards yeah. possibly on those little right. bobbins. So it's just, oh, so it was yeah, just it was... little, little teeny bits and that, it, but it got used. And then my other thing, my other goal was to walk three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> so I did what you and I both did. I think we both had that goal mm. and we both walked enough so that we were able to do the big surf. Right. The marathon at the but, end of April. Uh, at the end of April, but then after that, yeah. Did you walk, Kelly? No. Uh, no, I I, no. I I have not been very good. I I really haven't been very good about walking. I did, I, I did buy myself a Fitbit in August, and so I've been doing a little bit of. A little bit more walking since then than I did between April and August. But no, that goal was, a, except for getting ready for, once I got ready for Big Sur, that goal was history. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, the other thing too, for me, and this is my excuse, uh, last year, see, Enzo came to live with us mm-hmm. at the end of January. And so I actually have been doing pretty well with my walking up until the time that the puppy came home. And then when you have an eight-week-old puppy... It's yeah. hard you can't to be get at that. So at the timing of it, by the time end of January, I, you know, my mileage should have been much higher mm-hmm. than it's not just going for 45 minutes for, you yeah. know, it's now you're gone for five hours or something. Right. And I couldn't leave him that long. Yeah. Um, or I, or I didn't and he was right too leaving. young to do that kind of mileage. Yeah. He was too, yeah. He was only, you know, like eight and then just a few months old finally. I mean, what was he? Four months old when I came down for yeah. Big Sur. So, um, yeah, now he could do it, but, uh. Yeah. Anyway, so what other goals did you have? So my long-term goal was to work on the quilt that I've had for 30-some years. A long time since high school. (laughs) I started it in high school. So, and I actually made some good progress on that. It was good that I made that goal because I really, I really did keep it kind of in the front of my mind more than I would have if I hadn't done that. So that was the project that I worked on. I've not finished yet but during the summer I did get all of the the quilt pattern I thought it was the called Roman stripe but I don't think that's actually correct once I went and looked up Roman stripe quilts I didn't find something that looked like mine but it's it's three rectangles that sewn together to make a square you know three bars that make a Mm -hmm. square And so the outer two fabrics are the same and the inner fabric is different for the squares. And then you take those squares and you alternate the direction of the bars. Mm -hmm. And so in each strip. So I actually managed to put all of the little rectangles together into squares. And I now have all the squares sewn into strips. There's a big portion of the quilt that's already sewn together. I mean, it's already... Mm -hmm. The strips are already, you know, it's already like a big rectangle of multiple strips of squares. 
Mm -hmm. um, but then I have these other strips that have to be added on. Let me just say I made good progress. I am not finished. Mm -hmm. I'm not even close to finished. It's a hand stitched quilt. And I think I did convince myself that because it's a hand stitched quilt, it also has to be a hand quilted quilt. Once mm -hmm. I get the top of it done, I'm not going to make a firm decision on that until, you know, if, if, if this thing drags out for another 10 years, I may just, when the top is done, have somebody put it together and quilt it. Uh, but, but if I manage to finish the top in the next year or so, you know, who knows? I could, I could put it together and start, start hand quilting it and take another year to, <laughs> <laughs> to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely not a precision quilter. That's for sure. Um, I learned how to do quilting when I was in 4-H. So, you know, I was a kid and I thought, oh, I'll do this in, when I was in high school. And I did not pay attention to, well, I just didn't pay attention to precision at all. Accuracy was not important to me. <laughs> and so these squares vary in size. And so then when you sew them into strips, they don't line up. And so then I was doing all sorts of gyrations. This is way back when I was putting it together originally, doing all sorts of gyrations to make the seams line up and mm -hmm. restitching things to make the seams line up. I don't think I'm going to bother with that. I'm just going to sew. The rest of the strips are just going to be sewn together. If they line up, they do. And if they don't, they don't. And so there, it may be very clear where one era of this quilt ended and a new era started. Right. The last century, <laughs> the 20th century part of the quilt and the 21st century part of the quilt may look very different. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, I'm I'm glad to have made some progress on that. So that was good. And then... The other thing, well, we already talked about walking and in my notes, Marsha, I have about mm -hmm. walking being my goal mm -hmm. in my notes. I have walking followed by the abbreviation for rolling on the floor, laughing my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but the other goal that I actually did accomplish was we talked and I, there wasn't much more left to do in January when we talked about this, but I was trying to finish the yarn that I'd started spinning for my mom's best, the mm -hmm. Corydale. And it's interesting that that came up today because yesterday Robert and I went to visit my mom and Dennis and we went to the RV show, which that was fun, not fiber related, mm -hmm. but it was a very fun, it was fun to see all the different uh, RVs. She hadn't blocked it. She's, she'd finished it and I was asking about it because I knew I hadn't seen it and I was, you know, pretty sure she would have finished it by now. But, um, so she's finished it, but she hasn't blocked it. So mm -hmm. I said, well, let me have it. I'll take it and I'll block it because I have blocking wires. So mm -hmm. it will be a lot easier. So I have it now and sitting in my lap and oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. It's so, it's one strand of my Corydale two ply. Mm -hmm. And then another strand is Shibui and I can, Kava, Shibui Kava, which is a mm -hmm. cotton yarn wrapped with silk. Mm -hmm. And it's, the color was called, I bought that for her for, for her, uh, for Christmas last year. The color was called tar and I mm -hmm. thought it was going to be gray, but it's actually a blue gray, really blue. Well, especially against the brown of the Corydale. It's, it's really a blue color, but the two yarns together are really stretchy. I mean, mm -hmm. knitting is always stretchy, but it just feels so elastic and mm -hmm. stretchy. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to blocking this for her and seeing how it, how it finishes up after it's blocked. Um, because I think it'll be really, really pretty. The vest pattern that she used for this was Shibui Knits. Axis pattern by Shelly Anderson. Okay. So I'm writing this down so I can a, look it up. It's a tunic. I'll describe it a little bit. It's a tunic length vest. So you hold the two strands together, except on the one, one side has a lapel. So it's asymmetrical in the, in the top mm -hmm. and the lapel on the one side, you only do with the Shibui Kava. 
Okay. So you've got a little uh, lapel detail, you know, just the one yarn, where the rest of it is two yarns stranded together. And it originally mm -hmm. called for Shibui Pebble, which is a wool and silk yarn. So the pattern, I think, is a little more drapey than the yarn. This one is more elastic, I think, more bouncy mm -hmm. because of the the wool part is 100% Corydale. But mm -hmm. it's nice, and I'm looking forward to playing with it and getting it all blocked for her. So Very nice. Yeah. It's nice that, yeah. Had she been wearing it or no. not even wearing it? Mm -mm. No, she hadn't worn it, and I kind of wondered, did she run out of yarn? Mm-hmm. But she said no, she, she just hadn't washed and blocked it yet. And she was kind of not, you know, like trying to figure out where she was going to block it because my niece is now living with her while she finishes her degree. Mm -hmm. And so the spare room bed is being used. And, you know, so she was kind of like, okay, what am I going to do? So, sort of like I was about how I was going to block that swirl sweater that's really big. Oh, right. Yeah, until, we're gonna, yeah. Mm -hmm, until I realized yeah. I could use the sofa bed, <laughs> the, the queen size sofa bed. So, you know, I've done more blocking. So I thought, oh, I'll just block it for her. I have those blocking wires. It'll be easier for me to do it than for her. So, okay. Well, we've been talking. I'm, I just looked up the pattern. It's cute. Huh? Ravelry. Yeah, it's cute. Mm -hmm. And I think this would be really good looking on your mom because she's tall. Mm -hmm. I really like it. She'll look good in it. Yeah. So that's my, uh, my goal achievement. Goal update. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mix, a mixed well, bag. Good. Well, I think uh, for this year, um, I think we want to set some goals mm -hmm. too, right? Yeah. I have some I, some thoughts, mm -hmm. um, but I would like to talk about it in the next episode. So I have, I like to take some time to really think about it and... Um, yeah, I think that would be good. Yeah. Me so too. We can, we can, and if our listeners want to join in our goals, you know, setting goals too... Um, I'll give them time to think about it too, but I, we'll talk about it. I think in the next episode, that, what I, our goals yeah, are. that would yeah. be good. I, yeah. I was at a board meeting for the college the other night and one of the board members was, you know, saying happy new year to everyone, but she was saying, you know, she really, January is not her psychological new year. Her psychological oh. new year is when school starts in the fall. Oh, in September. Well, yeah. for us in August, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And I sort of feel the same way. I always think to myself, okay, it's, you know, Christmas is over. Now you need to sit down and you need to think about what you're going to do for January. But it just doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like the start of something to me. Mm -hmm. So, so this will be good. It'll give me, it'll give me two weeks to think about it. And also it'll give me a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Some accountability. Yes. I, I yeah. must yeah. get this done. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds great. All right. So, Marcia, remember when I went to the Fiber Shed Symposium in right. November? Yes. And I came back all mm -hmm. excited. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I, we had decided that we were going to have a little segment um, periodically about all of the different information that I got from Fiber Shed. So, this is, we're going to start that segment. Well, I guess we talked about Fiber Shed before, but. So this is one of those segments, I guess, today. So, mm -hmm. so one of the topics that came up in the Fiber Shed Symposium was about the carbon cycle and this idea of carbon farming. And I wanted mm -hmm. to do a little bit of research about this and, and what it really meant and what were the details. And so I did that this morning, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Okay. And the man who spoke, his name was Jeff Craik or Jeff Crakey, mm -hmm. C-R-E-Q-U-E. And he's the co-founder of the Marin Carbon Project. And he's also a director of the Carbon Cycle Institute. So he referenced some uh, publications that, that I went and I, I read one of the one of the scientific papers and just, I just want to uh, read the title of it because I, I love the titles of scientific papers. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I know, I know. This paper is called Impacts of Organic Matter Amendments on Carbon and Nitrogen Dynamics in Grassland Soils. <laughs> yes, by Riles et, huh? et al. So several authors, uh -huh. one of the authors' name is Riles, R-Y-A-L-S. Mm -hmm. And I'll put a link to this in our show notes so other people who are interested in geeky things like reading scientific papers can go and find it. But 
It was very interesting. And so I'm going to read just a small quote from the abstract, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the paper and the results. So here's a quote from the abstract. Our results indicate that a single application of compost to grassland soils can increase soil carbon and nitrogen storage over relatively short time periods and contribute to climate change mitigation. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty amazing. I never thought about compost having an impact on climate change. So I, I'm not a scientist. So what are they saying? So if you put compost on grasslands, you, right, you can what? you can help mitigate climate change. Okay. So you, okay. So how does that? I yeah. Mean, how? I know. Isn't that? I don't understand how. I just thought that was so so amazing. Yeah. They did this experiment, and they did it in valley grasslands and coastal grasslands, so two different areas. And they mm -hmm. made a one-time application of about 1.3 centimeters of compost. So that's about a half an inch of compost. Made a mm -hmm. one-time application. And then they studied the soil. They measured the carbon and also the nitrogen in the soil before they applied the compost. And then they measured it for three years after the compost was put mm -hmm. on. And what they found was that after three years, the soil carbon had gone up by 26% in the valley grasslands and by 37% in the coastal grasslands. So that means hmm. essentially the, the plants are taking carbon out of the, so plants are taking carbon out of the atmosphere as they grow, right? They take in carbon dioxide and do photosynthesis and that's how they get their, their food. That's mm -hmm. very simplified, but that's, that's the way I understand <laughs> right. it. And right. so that carbon dioxide is the, you know, the same kind of carbon dioxide that's contributing to global warming. If you can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you're reducing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's, that's contributing to global warming, climate change. Mm -hmm. So they take the carbon dioxide out of the soil, I mean, out of the air. And then when the plants, like plant litter decomposes, that carbon then becomes in the soil. The idea is that, that this is a way to sequester carbon, to take it from the atmosphere and store it in the soil in order to reduce the amount of carbon, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So you can reduce it by putting it back, by putting it into the soil. Okay. I guess Does that, that. makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, yeah. so, and what they found was it's a it's a combination of, first, what happens is the compost adds carbon to the soil, but then the compost increases the plant production, and then the plants grow better because of the increased organic material in the soil. The plants grow mm -hmm. better, and then because the plants are growing more strongly, they need more fuel so they take more carbon out of the atmosphere and then you know they die back parts of plants die back and so the bigger the plant is when it dies back the more there is to go back into the soil yeah and then the more there is in the soil the bigger the plants grow and you have this sort of virtuous cycle instead of a vicious cycle mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. getting better and better each each year and I thought that was really interesting. And then the other thing that happened, that happens in this like upward spiral is not just the carbon is increasing, the percentage of carbon increasing, but the percentage of nitrogen in the soil is increasing as well. So there's not just benefits to the, the atmosphere, but there's benefits to the plant material. There's benefits to the animals that graze on those mm -hmm. lands and the nitrogen went up after three years, the nitrogen was up 54% in one of the types of grasslands, the valley grasslands, and 53% in the coastal grasslands. That's a lot. That's a big yeah. increase in nitrogen. To me, that seems like a huge increase in yeah. nitrogen. They talked about the fact that in the 1800s, so, so why, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. So there's this idea in the literature that the grasslands now don't have as much carbon in them as they once did. 
Mm-hmm. And so there's a, there's a, an ability to capture carbon from the atmosphere, get the plants to replenish it in the soil. There's like a, there's a debt, you know, a carbon debt in the soil. And so if you can, if you can grab it from the atmosphere and put it into the soil, that can help to deplete the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. Like mm-hmm. if the soil was all full up and couldn't handle anymore, then this wouldn't be possible. And so, you know, the, one of the, one of the questions is, is there a maximum capacity? And if there is, why is it not at that capacity already? Right. And so right. there's some uh, discussion of the fact that in the 1800s, um, at least in California, in the 1800s, there was a shift from perennial plants in the grasslands to annual plants in the grasslands Mm -hmm. and that that might have caused a decline in the carbon stocks in the soil and that because of because of practices management practices range management practices the amount of carbon in the soil might still actually be declining and so that's really interesting because it means that there's a big a big impact that you can have there's a there's a you know, if the carbon stock in the soil is declining, then there's a lot of space. It's not really space, but there's a lot of ability to take carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it into the soil. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I I thought that was pretty amazing. Also pretty hopeful. Mm -hmm. Agriculture is a big industry. And so if you could use agriculture to not produce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but to take it out of the atmosphere, to go the other direction, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's just, that's like mind, it was mind boggling to me. I had never, I mean, it had never occurred to me. I had always thought of reducing carbon as the amount that's there is there and, you know, okay, we could grow more plants, like not deforest things. That would be helpful. But the real ways to, to kind of have an impact on climate change would be to stop doing things, you know, stop driving your car so much, stop doing, right. stop yeah. doing it's bad. About don't put the carbon. Yeah. It's, it's the focus is, but don't put the carbon into the air, right. reduce the amount that's going into the air, which is important, right. but it's also just how to get it out of the air. Right. There's a way right. to, yeah. their, their plants can help mm-hmm. us take it out of the air and put it back in the soil and with very, I mean, a half an inch of compost. That's all it took. I thought that was really interesting. Okay. So there's this thing now called carbon farming. And so I'm going to read a little bit from the carbon cycle Institute about carbon farming just briefly. Uh, So it says why carbon farming? Land management is the second largest contributor to carbon dioxide emissions on planet Earth. Agriculture is the one sector that has the ability to transform from a net emitter of CO2 to a net sequesterer of CO2. Mm -hmm. There's no other human-managed realm with this potential. Common agricultural practices, including driving a tractor, tilling the soil, overgrazing, Using fossil fuel-based fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides result in significant carbon dioxide release. Alternatively, carbon can be stored long-term for decades or centuries or more, beneficially in soils in a process called soil carbon sequestration. Carbon farming involves implementing practices that are known to improve the rate at which CO2 is removed from the atmosphere and converted to plant material and or soil organic matter. So this idea that you can actually have a net reduction in carbon dioxide from the farming practices. What are those practices? How would they be different than what we're doing now? I mean, is it? Well, one of them, one of them is this idea of, of compost application. The compost, Half inch of compost. And just to be clear, compost is different than fertilizer, right? Because farmers are throwing fertilizer on right. their fields, but that's different than compost. Right. Compost is like or, green, wa- green waste mm-hmm. that decomposes into compost. Like you have a right. compost pile in your backyard, yes. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, and, and this is not like for crops. This is rangeland. So like okay. where your cattle graze, where your sheep graze. 
Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, the one one of the carbon farms is a uh, bear farm. That is where I the wool was grown for the cloth that mm-hmm. I ordered. So I, I don't know. This whole thing is just. It, it just sort of boggled my mind to think that you could implement practices on a farm that ended up with you actually putting more carbon dioxide in more carbon into the soil and and quite a bit more into the soil than you are actually emitting using your tractors and all that stuff mm-hmm. just yeah no, that's fascinating it, i mean it's kind of it, it is it actually is really kind of hopeful, yeah, inspiring and hopeful. It, it was very, um, it was very inspiring. So mm-hmm. I mean, and here, so okay, so here's one more number amount: carbon sequestration. The amounts that they have measured, um, at least one ton per hectare per year for thirty years. This is what they project that this one half inch of compost can do. 30 years, one ton per hectare. A hectare is big. I don't know how big it is, but it's big. One ton <laughs> per hectare per year for 30 years. With no other applications right. of compost. Right, Just that one, one application. One half inch, yes. So what if they add more, com- if they keep adding more compost, is that, do they? I don't know. Uh, that I don't okay. know. I mean, I, it's, it's expensive to do that on mm-hmm. rangeland, you know, to apply compost. And they actually, the Fiber Shed organization actually has a program, and I'll link to it in the show notes and we'll maybe talk a little bit more about it, but they actually have a program where you can donate. So you donate an amount of money that's equivalent of, you know, providing compost for one acre or something like that. It does cost the ranchers money to do this. It's money and time and, you know, Mm -hmm. something that's not part of their normal practices. But anyway, that is just amazing what it can do. And then on top of that, you know, it increases the water holding capacity of the soil so that mm-hmm. means that the soil can, the plants in the soil can withstand drought better. I mean, there's mm-hmm. tons of other benefits, but, but it just, it was pretty amazing. You know, I put compost in my garden, well, my vegetable garden, but just the flower beds, mm-hmm. uh, because it, it, because for the water retention, to, the water stays in the soil longer if you have a good layer of compost on top of the flower bed. Even if you have compost in the soil, like not just on top, but just in the soil. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. very interesting. I'm very inspired. We'll talk, Mm -hmm. I think maybe one of the things we can talk about this year, if people are interested, I'm interested in doing more gardening this year. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that if people are interested. I know a lot of, a lot of our listeners do have, they, they have vegetable gardens. I'm not so good at vegetable gardening or I'm not good at staying interested in a vegetable garden, (laughs) 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 but I, I, I want to. I want to do more of all types of gardening this year. So, mm-hmm. so that might be something we talk about more compost piles and how they work, but I'm kind of inspired just to think maybe my use of compost, even on my own property might be helping with carbon sequestration. It just gives me a different perspective on growing things. Yeah. You know? Anyway, I thought it was yeah. very interesting and I have one yeah, last thing to to mention that I think is just an amazing fact that I got from the Carbon Cycle Institute website. They said that in California, clothing consumption results in the same carbon footprint as powering approximately half of the California homes. Oh, okay. Say what? Yeah. (laughs) What? California clothing consumption results in the same carbon footprint as powering half of California homes. Is that the distribution of all the, the production and distribution of all the clothing? Because like, it's all brought in, I mean, well, most clothing is brought in from, you know, offshore. It's manufactured right. offshore. So right. the container ship's bringing all this stuff in and then the truck's trucking it all around. Well, and in the, the, the manufacture s- process of it has a carbon footprint. So if you just took, if you just looked at the carbon put, footprint, like, you know how people talk about the carbon footprint of what they purchase. Mm-hmm. So like the carbon footprint of a garment that a person purchases. If you took all of those and added them up for the whole state of California, all that carbon footprint for all that clothing, half of California homes. <laughs> That's just a I'm sorry. To I'm just like, so like every time I just bought two new t-shirts, long sleeve mm-hmm. t-shirts. 
this week. That's the carbon foot. One T-shirt is the carbon footprint of po- powering my house. Lights for my well, house. Well, <laughs> it has a carbon p- footprint. I don't know how much your one T-shirt has. I know, but but yeah, the the sum total. At least in California, we're we're a big state, um, mm-hmm. but we also have a lot of houses too. So we use a lot of power, right. a lot of air conditioning and stuff. But yeah, if you took all the clothing from California and you looked at that carbon footprint. According to this website, the climate or carbon right. carbon cycle institute, that carbon footprint of all that clothing is the same as half of the power that is used in California homes. So what they're talking about then is like everything from start to finish. So probably if it's a cotton t shirt, mm-hmm. it's growing the cotton. Say the cotton's mm-hmm. grown in the United States, mm-hmm. then all of the the carbon foot of processing that cotton. It's sent the carbon, the fuel that's used to send it to offshore to be manufactured, right. the manufacturing process to bring it back to the United States, mm-hmm. send it out to all the stores, putting it on the shelves because there's a having all these stores too, right? Yep. To, uh, to sell a t-shirt, you have to have a store that has air conditioning and heat and light. Mm-hmm. And then you drive to the store to get the t-shirt mm-hmm. and you drive home. Right. Or the delivery truck drives it to your house. Right. Mm-hmm. There's a big movement now for people to make their own clothing, you know, to make mm-hmm. their whole wardrobe. And I I don't think I would ever be part of that movement because I don't, I don't know, maybe I, maybe I would get to that point. I'm not sure. Right now, it does not sound appealing to make all of my clothing. But it, it does make me think, okay, of the, you know, the fact that I don't consume a lot of clothing is probably good. The fact that I do make some of my clothing is good. If you think about not, not, okay, how do I do less bad, but how do I do more good? The things I make or the things that I resist purchasing are helping to, to, you know, lower that carbon footprint of clothing consumption in my state. Mm -hmm. That's really amazing to me. So, but the, here's the good news, Marsha. I have some good news. Oh, yay. (laughs) So the wool I bought? <laughs> yes. Carbon negative. Ah. So this is this is this community supported cloth. Not 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 carbon neutral, being carbon, carbon negative. negative. So, it put, so that means it put it took carbon, carbon out of the air and put it into the soil. Okay. So a typical wool garment made from this cloth that's being uh, made from sheep that are living on one of these carbon farms. Uh, and there are several farms in the state now that have these carbon plans where they're being helped to identify practices that they can use, the mulching being one of them, and then there are other practices as well. So they're being, they're being helped to start these practices that are helping to sequester carbon. So Mm -hmm. for a typical wool garment from wool that comes from these sheep, taking into consideration all of the parts of the production of the garment, not just the the farm, Mm -hmm. there would be 75 pounds of CO2 emissions if it were done in the standard way and done in this carbon farming Mm -hmm. way. Instead of 75 pounds going into the atmosphere of CO2, there would be 70 pounds of CO2 going into the soil. Blows my mind. And it sounds like they don't have to work that hard to do it. Do they have to work that hard to to make something carbon negative? Well, I mean, there's work to it, but but it is true that a lot of these practices, they're not just good for carbon sequestration. There's benefits to them. There's other benefits to them. Mm-hmm. So, for example, something called silvopasture, where you put trees and pasture land together. Mm-hmm. That helps your grass, you know, your the what the animals eat, helps it grow better because it's not mm-hmm. subject to blasting sun all day long. And mm-hmm. it, there's there's some interaction between the you know root system of the trees and the and the other plants in the pasture. So it's like, it's a benefit. It's more than just a carbon sequestration benefit, 
But, you know, it's the work and it's expense to buy the trees to make sure the trees get mm-hmm. irrigated while they're young and growing and all that. Putting in windbreaks or shelter belts, putting in hedgerows. You know, it's, it's well, work. And, and I was, I was going to say, too, if you plant trees, mm-hmm. you're taking away space for grass, too. Um, right. Right. You know, like, I don't know how many acres of trees they're planting, but... Well, but it's uh, not, they, it's not like they plant an acre of trees. It's like they plant a tree here, a tree there, a tree here, a tree Oh, there. okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So you're not, you're not, you're not giving up space for grazing. Right. By plant, the way the, ple- the trees are planted. Right. It's, I mean, okay, so you're okay. giving up whatever the diameter of the trunk of the tree is. <laughs> 12 inches. <laughs> But that's it. (laughs) Yeah, but that's it. So anyway, there's a whole list of these practices that they have on the um, Carbon Cycle Institute website. And and they're all, actually, they're all practices, or most of them are practices that the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service has already, you know, been promoting among, you know, among farmers and ranchers for years and years and years. It's not, Mm -hmm. a lot of it is not new. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so instead of so instead of putting out seventy five pounds of CO two into the atmosphere, you actually end up putting seventy pounds of CO two into the into the ground. Very cool. Yeah, I, it's just I mean, it, it's just amazing to me that this idea that this could be happening. And so if they can get you know if they can get companies to be interested in buying this wool to make clothing for sale on a large scale, that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. I mean, those of us who bought it on a really small scale, okay, my one garment, or Mm -hmm. maybe it's not even a garment that I make. It's not going to do very much, but, but you know, people buy wool shirts. Let's say somebody makes wool shirts and they make it, let's say Pendleton starts making their, and I don't know, maybe they already are. You know, maybe they already are getting their wool from farms that do this. Or maybe they're interested and they're trying to find, you know, enough farmers to source their wool from who are doing this. When I heard about it at, at the fiber shed, it was mind-blowing. And when I read about it even more, it's like, wow, this it's really hopeful. It's like, okay, there's something that can be done. Yes, and we need something hopeful. So mm-hmm. <laughs> this, mm-hmm. is, this is good, yeah. We can all do something. And, mm-hmm. and this idea that, agri- I mean, agriculture is huge. And the, one oh, of the, yeah. the woman, her name was Lonnie Estill from Bear Ranch. She's the one whose sheep, Rambouillet sheep, supplied the wool. Uh, she was saying that in her mind, agriculture is the only industry large enough and with the potential to make changes to global climate change. Hmm. Yeah. Very, it's very interesting, and, and uh, as I said, it, you know, it's hopeful. Mm-hmm. It's nice to hear something hopeful. It's an issue where you think, oh, there's nothing I can do, mm-hmm. but there is, especially yeah. if you're a farmer. Cool, but also <laughs> if you're a consumer because they need people to yeah, consume their products. Right. Yeah. So, very cool. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to hear what the next installment of uh, report on fiber shed is going to be. All right. Well, I will link because the. I will link in the show notes to their website because they just put out their videos from the wool symposium. So they have a lot of it captured on video. And so I will put that link in the show notes in case people are interested in seeing some of the presentations that, that they had in the wool symposium, which is partly where this information came from. Okay, cool. All right. So there's one last thing that I wanted to do. Is there anything else you need to talk about? Nope. Okay. Nothing for me. Okay. Well, we've had quite a few people introducing themselves to our group. Too many for me to list them all, but I wanted to do a particular shout out to our international listeners because Mm -hmm. we have six new, uh, I don't know if they're new listeners, but newly introduced themselves to the group. So one of them is Angie, and her name, her rivalry name is Tatstent, and she's in North Yorkshire in the UK. And then there's Leah, this lush corner in Canberra, Australia, and Gemma, 
Gemma Bell unraz- uh, unrazzlery. <laughs> <laughs> unravelry. Uh, and she's mm-hmm. from Glasgow in the UK. And then we have Sharon, who is Celeste Wa on Ravelry, and she's from Perth in Australia. And then there's okay. Aurora, uh, also known as Sina Loon on Ravelry, mm-hmm. and she's from Ile de France in France. And then we have Patrick, who is the mini farmer on Ravelry, and he's from Ireland. So okay. six listeners recently introduced themselves from different countries, which I think is so cool. And thank you so much for introducing yourselves. And I'm so glad you're listening. Yeah. Very cool. Our international audience. Yeah. Who, who knew? I know. Uh, very exciting. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think that's it for this week. So we will talk in two weeks and talk about our um, goals. Yes. For the 2017 year. Sounds good. Yes. All right. Okay. Okay. We'll talk soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. To subscribe to the podcast, visit 2usefiberadventures.com. We have links for iTunes, Google Play Music, YouTube, and others. Join us on our adventures on Ravelry and Instagram. I am Better in Motion, and Kelly is 100 Projects. Until next time, we're the 2us. Doing Doing our our part part for World Fleece. Fleece.